Houndour and Houndoom belong to that category of Pokémon introduced in Generation 2, but weren't available until the post-game. They were used by Karen and a Rocket Admin in Generation 2, but other than that, they're barely seen. You could easily mistake Houndour for a Generation 4 Pokémon, as Pokémon Platinum was the first game to make it available before the League. Was Houndour just too powerful to use in Johto, or was it another case of Game Freak locking a Pokémon into the post-game for no discernible reason? Let's find out together. As always, before we begin, we'll start with the seven rules of the challenge. Number one, the timer will start when walking away from Professor Elm after receiving the starter Pokémon. Number two, only the challenge Pokémon may be used in battle. Number three, no items in battle except balls to catch HM friends. Number four, no evasion increasing TMs such as Double Team. Number five, no intentional uses of glitches or exploits. Number six, no rare candies until facing red. And number seven, the timer may be paused for breaks in recording, but no inputs may be made when the timer is paused. And with all that, let's get into the challenge. I used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to replace Cyndaquil with Houndour. I named it Papa, and I am on my way. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have the Level Up and Compatible TM and HM Learn sets. On the right-hand side of the screen, we'll always have the current move, a picture of the Pokémon, the Pokémon's base stats, the number of resets, the timer, and the Pokémon's type. A couple of stats stand out to me. Firstly, Houndour's special attack is massive for a base form Pokémon. It's got very low physical defense, though, so we've got to look out for those fighting and ground types, as they may prove to be problematic later on in the game. And we're ready for our first rival battle. The rival's got a Totodile, which of course means we aren't going to be able to deal anything but not very effective damage, and the rival does use Scratch, which is quite bad when your physical defense is as low as ours, but a few embers later and we get the job done, and we beat rival number one. This is one of the few battles where it doesn't actually matter if you lose, because the game will progress anyway. It's the same for you scene and a battle on the SS Aqua. So we name the rival triple question mark as we always do, and we make our way up to Sprout Tower. This is another one of those instances where Sprout Tower is easy for us because we have a type advantage over all those Bell Sprouts, and the final trainer has two Bell Sprouts and a Hoot Hoot. So Hoot Hoot will take a couple more hits, but we do get the burn on, which reduces Hoot Hoot's attack, which means we aren't taking massive physical damage from tackle. And the final Bell Sprout comes out, we knock it out in one hit, we grow to level 12, we beat Sage Lee, and we can move on to the gym itself. In the gym, Falconer does have Mud Slap, so that could be a little bit of a worry. His signature move is a ground type move, even though he's flying, and we lose one bit of accuracy from the Pidgey. Out comes Pidgeotto, we Ember it, it starts using Gust and gets critical hit, which is good for us because it's not using a super effective move, and we knock it out in three hits. And in just under nine and a quarter minutes, we get our first badge. We can move on to Azalea Town and start looking for our HM friends of the run. I've settled on using Paris and Psyduck as my HM friends that I catch. The reason being that Paris can learn Sweet Scent, Dig, Cut, and Flash, which are all very useful moves, and Dig especially means I don't have to pay for escape ropes, which saves me a lot of money, and that means I can buy more potions, heal less often, and save a little bit of time. And Psyduck is just the perfect HM friend. It learns the three water HMs along with strength, and they're the HMs I'm missing with all the other catches put together. So after we've caught them, we can move on to Kurt. We deal with the rocket segment and nothing really interesting happened, and now it's time for Bugsy. Our type disadvantage to Bug is negated by the fire type, and we have a type advantage over his Bug type by being fire as well. It's a one-hit wonder on the Metapod and the Kakuna, and that just leaves his Scyther. Scyther comes out and we deal just under half damage with our first Ember. A Fury Cutter gets critical hit on us and he starts quick attacking, but it's too late. We have beaten him with a time of 18 minutes and 28 seconds, so we got an identical split for both Falkner and Bugsy. I think that's the first time that's ever happened. We get Bugsy's badge and we can start thinking about rival number two. And the first thing I do is replace Smog with Swift. Smog is just dead weight as a move, and Swift will be 100% accurate all of the time and will deal neutral damage to his Croconaw. And we do have quite high physical attack, even though our special attack is our highest stat. So out comes the Ghastly. We use Ember on it because we don't have a Dark type move and we knock it out in two hits. Out comes Croconaw, and I was a little bit worried about Croconaw, but he starts using Rage. Water Gun takes us to roughly half health, another Water Gun takes us into the yellow, but that's not enough to knock us out, and now it's just about knocking out this Zubat. Leech Life does a little bit of damage, taking us to six, but we knock out the Zubat in a couple of embers. So we can now move onwards into the Ilex Forest where we get cut off the Charcoal Master. 
We then talk to his apprentice back in the home and get the charcoal. Thank you to Dark Hydra T for reminding me of its location. We get headbutt along with the bike, and then we can go into the Goldenrod Underground where we pick up the coin case and give our Hound Hour a little bit of a haircut. We get the haircut so that we can increase our Pokemon's affection, and the higher the affection, the higher amount of damage that Return will deal. So when we inevitably have to use it a little bit later on in the game, we will have a much better chance of knocking out Pokemon quicker. We then take on this super nerd who has the Magnemite and the Voltorb, and for once Magnemite isn't an issue because we've got a fire type move. Off the Voltorb we get a level up and we learn Bite, we replace Leah with Bite because that is going to give us a stab dark type move as well as a stab fire type move. Swift is also good to have and Roar is excellent to have if Pokemon sets up on us. We then move on to the game corner where we buy the coins for the Abra. We buy the Abra itself and we can move on to getting Kenya the Spearow. Kenya the Spearow is our freebie Pokemon that we get just for talking to a guard. And that is very, very handy because it means we don't have to worry about catching a flyer. We then move on to the Flower Shop sister. We get Dig and we can finally take on Whitney. Now we're at a major type disadvantage to Whitney's rollout so we've got to try and knock it out very quickly. However, we can't even knock out the Clefairy in one hit, so this is looking like it could be a struggle. Out comes the Miltank, it uses Rollout, and I think we're just going to get knocked out like we did just there. Let's try again. Hopefully this time we can get a burn off or something on the Miltank and see what happens. We knock out the Clefairy, we're in green health. Rollout does almost half damage. Rollout hits for a second time and knocks us out, so I decide to level up on the trainers inside the gym. We get a level up on the Meowth trainer and we'll try again at level 22. Maybe the extra little base stats we get from the level will be enough to beat Whitney. So we're back onto her Clefairy. We bite the Clefairy to take it down into yellow health, but it uses Soft Boil. We bite it again and it uses Bubble Beam. I feel like Whitney's Clefairy is just mocking us at this point. We're on 42 health and we do exactly half damage from Rollout, so we have to try again. I'm going to keep trying a couple of times at each level until we eventually get the breakthrough. We use Bites, we flinch the Clefairy and we are on full health for the Miltank. It uses Rollout, takes us down by about 19, and then gets a critical hit. So I decide at this point to just train up on random trainers around Goldenrod City, because we need that extra level. We get a level off the Fire Breather just south of the National Park. Hopefully this will now be enough to beat Whitney and her pesky pair of normal-type Pokémon. We get a level up off the Clefairy, and we are on to the Mill Tank with full HP a couple of levels higher. Rollout misses and that might be the lucky break we need as we take it into the red and we finally knock out Whitney and her mill tank and we get a well-deserved evolution off the back of that as well. Our Houndoom has become a Hound Hour, we get a lovely base stat buff and we can hopefully now take on the rest of the game with a little bit more ease. Although we still have to worry about our physical defence, we are only at 50 for physical defence, it is our weakest stat by a very long way. We're on to rival number three, he leads with a Haunter, and we have a stab dark move to take care of the Haunter this time, so that goes down in a single hit. We bite the Croconaw, Water Gun does minimal damage, and it's two hits for the Croconaw. Zubat's next, and we use a single bite to knock it out. That just leaves the pesky Magnemite, but we have Ember for Magnemite. We take it down in a single hit, and rival three was very easy. With that, we can move on to the gym itself and take on Morty. Morty is a ghost type leader and I don't think we'll have any issues, we are a dark type and dark is super effective against ghosts so I think Houndoom will just see lunch with his Pokemon. I'm so confident that I didn't even heal before the beginning of this battle and we Oko the Ghastly, Haunts us next and goes down in very similar ways, Gengar gets out sped and goes down to a single bite as well and the final Pokemon is Haunter. Haunter goes down, we grow to level 29 and we have defeated Morty. We get the Fog Badge and we can move on to the Lighthouse in Olivine City. Before we go in the Lighthouse, we grab strength from the man in the cafe. We use this opportunity to teach it to Psyduck along with Surf. And while we're teaching moves from the bag, I take the opportunity to replace Swift with Headbutt. I think the only real way we're going to get through Morty's gym is by using Headbutt and having the chance to flinch. When we're at Simonwood City, we of course pick up the secret potion before entering into the gym, and our first test is going to be the Black Belt. I purposely use Bite at the beginning of this battle just to get a judge of how bad the damage is going to be as we go through this battle, and the answer is very bad. However, if we use Headbutt, we should be able to get through the first Black Belt and onto the second one. We use Headbutt, it flinches, and Headbutt has done its job. We're on full health for the second one and have no further issues as we go through the gym trainers, so it's on to Chuck. Chuck leads with a Primeape. 
We head butt it. It uses Leah, which is really bad for us because of our low physical defense. We're onto the Polyrath. Polyrath has a double type advantage over us, but Dynamic Punch misses twice in a row, and we get the victory. That was a huge relief because I genuinely expected to be stuck there for about 10 or 15 minutes and having to level up on the Pokemon in the ocean, which when you're a fire type isn't the most convenient thing to do. As a little extra reward, we get Fly off Chuck's wife, and we're going to make our way to the Lake of Rage, where we grab the Rare Candy and the Hidden Power TM, the two staples of the Lake of Rage, before taking on the Gyarados. Now, I don't believe Gyarados has any water-type moves, so we shouldn't be in too much of a pickle, although it does mean we have to use Bite. Thrash does big damage and almost knocks us out, but we are able to take care of the Gyarados, get the red scale, and have a little chat with Lance. Lance initiates the first of the big rocket segments of the game, and nothing interesting ever happens in this segment, so I'll skip it and go straight on to Price and his Icy-type Pokémon. I say Price is an Ice-type leader. His first Pokémon is Pure Water, and that's a bit of an issue for us because we're a Fire-type. However, we do have Headbutt and Bite. We make the seal flinch and knock it out in two hits. That brings us on to the dual type dugong. We flinch with the first bite. We don't flinch with the second bite, but three bites is enough to keep us well in triple digits HP as we go to the pile of swine. We don't quite knock out the pile of swine in one hit. That means he's going to use a hyper potion, but it is just a simple battle. We have the type advantage over his last Pokemon and we can move on to Jasmine. I misclick and accidentally use Bite on the first turn, but I get a lucky flinch so that doesn't matter and we can start Embering. Out comes the Steelix. Steelix is part ground type, but ground doesn't resist fire, and a huge hit from Iron Tail is not enough to knock us out. She heals up, but we take down the Steelix, and now it's a mere formality for the final Magnemite. Magnemite goes down in a single hit, and we can get on with the housekeeping that we do at this point in the game. There's always a long wait in between Badge 7 and Badge 8 as the storyline climaxes, so it makes sense to pick up those odd bits and pieces that we've missed just at this point. We grab the rare candies and return, and we can take on rival number 4. As I always say, the rivals team seems to fall apart the further in the game we go. So we bite the Golbat, it uses Wing Attack, which doesn't do much damage, we're still comfortably in the green as the Fur Alligator comes out. A bite flinches it, and that means we're not going to get hit by a super effective water type move. Out comes Magnemite, I use Ember first time correctly this time. We've got Bites for the Haunter, and his final Pokemon is a Sneasel. Sneasel's Ice type, and with very low special, it goes down to a single Ember, and we have defeated Rival 4. Rival 2 and sometimes Rival 3 are the only dangerous ones. While we're in the underground, we battle this Burglar. This Burglar has a pair of Coughing and a Magmar, and with the three Pokemon combined, we level up to level 41. Level 41's great for Houndoom because that gives us Flamethrower. Flamethrower is a very strong fire type move. It's the fire equivalent of Surf, except you can't set fire to grass and get rid of it that way. After we've beaten the Burglar, we go to Mary and pick up the Pink Bow. We also pick up Sunny Day from the Lady in the Radio Tower, and we can finally move on to Claire. Claire is a Dragon-type leader, but her ace is a Kingdra which knows Surf, so this could be dangerous. In between battles, I've replaced Headbutt with Return, because Return will be stronger, and we already have a flinching move with Bite. We do get paralysed off the first Dragonair, and that is bad, so I decide to reset, and this time I'm holding a Paralyzed Cure Berry. We get paralysed off the first Dragonair again, but the berry cures it, and we are on to the Kingdra. We start off with a bite, it flinches, I then use Flamethrower to make sure she doesn't go into healing range, and a return is all it takes to knock out the Kingdra, we are on to Dragonair. We bite the Dragonair, it flinches, and we bite it for a second time to let it go down. I don't think we're going to lose this battle at this point, we flinch the final Dragonair and knock it out. We have beaten Claire with a time of roughly 1 hour and 10 minutes after we do the Dragon's Den segment, and very quickly before we move on to New Bark Town, we get the Black Glasses from the Dark Cave. They're like the other type enhancing items, and these ones boost the Dark type moves for 10%. We also get the Solar Beam TM, and we can move on into Victory Road, where we have the final rival battle of the game. Is his team going to be any more cohesive than it was before? I doubt it, but we'll find out together. This time he leads with Sneasel, which goes down to a single flamethrower. For Alligator comes out, I use Bite. It flinches, and it's a carbon copy of the last battle. Out comes Golbat. We use a flamethrower on the Golbat, and the Golbat gets ignited and goes down. Haunter's next. We've got Bite for Haunter, and it goes down in a single hit. That just leaves his Kadabra and his Magnemite, and we have the type advantage over the pair of them. 
Kadabra goes down in a single hit. Final Pokemon is now Magneton. That goes down to a single hit as well, and we have beaten the rival, and we will never see him again for the rest of this playthrough. And we can start making our preparations for the Pokemon League. As always, the first thing we'll do is heal up our Pokemon, and then we will deposit our HM and Field Move friends. We say thank you to Kenya, to Abra, to Psyduck, and to Paris. They've been a great help during the Johto region, and I'm sure they'll be a great help in the Kanto region. We get our four Phil Restores, and then we take on the League. The first League member is Will, and he is a Psychic-type trainer, so this should be very easy. He leads with Zatu. Zatu uses Quick Attack, but we knock it out in a single bite. Executor's next, and we have two options for the Executor, so I decide to throw some flames at it and it goes down. He sends out Slowbro, which is a water type. However, it is still part psychic type and it goes down to a single hit. Jinx comes out and Jinx is very flammable and melts to a single flamethrower. Final Pokemon is Zatu and a carbon copy of the first Zatu. We knock it out and grow to level 50. Koga's next. Koga has a lot of bug types and a lot of other types that are weak to fire. So Ariados goes down in one. Forotress is four times weak to fire so we knock it out in a single hit. Out comes Muck. Muck is the bulkiest of his Pokemon and it uses Minimal Eyes, which is really bad, but we do manage to bite it. Crobat's next and we're going to have to use a Flamethrower a couple of times. He uses Double Team, which is very annoying, but we do have Faint Attack and Faint Attack hits through the accuracy drops. Final Pokemon is Venomoth. Venomoth is flammable and goes down to a single flamethrower as well, so we can move on to Bruno. Bruno's getting a bit of a reputation for being quite scary in some of these runs. He's a fighting type trainer, so we are initially weak to him, and we have paltry physical defense and really poor HP. We get onto the Hitmonlee with relatively good HP, but a high jump kick does massive damage, and we are only on 21 HP for the Hitmonchan, and that is enough to knock us out. So we'll try again, see if we can get any different luck this time. Flamethrower almost but not quite knocks out Hitmontop, so we get a little bit of damage off the Hitmontop with its super effective dig. Out comes Hitmonlee. We don't Oko, but his high jump kick misses and he knocks himself out. That gives us a much better position for the Hitmonchan. We're just under half HP as we knock out the Hitmonchan, and that takes us on to his Onyx. Onyx is resistant to Flamethrower, however Onyx has such low stats that it still goes down, and we are left with Machamp. Machamp misses Cross Chop, he uses a Max Potion, but we outspeed, so we cannot do anything but win this battle now. And we can move on to Karen. It's Dark Type versus Dark Type as she leads with Umbreon, and this time we don't need to worry so much about Sand Attack, as we have Faint Attack, and that will never miss. As we move on to the Murkrow, it uses Quick Attack against us, but a Flamethrower is enough to knock it down in one. Out comes her Houndoom, but we have Return, and that means we are the superior Houndoom, and we knock it out in just a couple of hits. We're on great health as we learn Crunch instead of Bite. That means we are losing the opportunity to flinch, but we can get a special defense drop instead. Vileplume comes out, and we have Flamethrower for that, and that will just leave her Gengar. Gengar is weak to Crunch, so he gets tested out. We get a critical hit just to be mean, and we have beaten Karen. We are through the four Elite Four trainers with a time of 1 hour and 24 minutes. We can move on to Lance next. Lance could be tricky because he does lead with a Gyarados that loves to start rain dancing. We're going to have to use a little bit of strategy here, but as always, I will try with my current learn set and our current level to see just how we get on. We're on Z-Aerodactyl, and Crunch does quite good damage, but not enough to knock it out. A Rock Slide hits us very hard. We've moved on to his first Dragonite with the rain continuing to fall. Crunch deals half damage, but a Hyper Beam knocks us out. It's at this point I teach Sunny Day over Faint Attack because we aren't really going to have to deal with many more highly evasive Pokemon in the future, and that will give us a boost to our Fire-type moves. So we lead with a Crunch as normal. He uses Rain Dance, so I decide to use Sunny Day. Surf does very little damage because of the Sunny Day, and we can use Crunch to knock out the Gyarados. We now have the Sun boosting our moves, but Fire is resisted by Rock, and Rock Slide still does great damage. However, a second Fire Blast does knock out the Aerodactyl. We get a burn on the Dragonite, and that will reduce its physical attack, which is great because Hyper Beam would have knocked us out otherwise, and we crunch it to take down Dragonite number one. Dragonite number two comes out though, and a Blizzard is all it takes to knock us out. At this point, as I teach Hidden Power, you may notice that the splits have gone. That's because I called it a night at that point. I was getting very salty and Windows Update happened. However, I do play on an external device, so I didn't lose any progress, and it is still the same run with the same timer going. 
We knock out the Gyarados and we are on to Aerodactyl. This time we have Hidden Power for the Aerodactyl and it is an Ice type, but we still don't Oko, which is very frustrating. That means we're on 70 HP as Dragonite number one comes out. The rain is falling, however, that doesn't make any difference to our Hidden Power as we knock out the first and second Dragonites in one hit. It being four times weak to Ice really helps us out there, and now we can use Return on Charizard. Charizard's Hyper Beam does a lot less than I thought it would, and we're on 19 HP. It's all about outspeeding this final Dragonite, which we do, and we have beaten Lance for the time of 1 hour 29 minutes and 3 seconds. Those splits will now start to populate again as the video goes on. Apologies for losing them, there wasn't much I could do, and I was very annoyed at my PC. And we are through the league with a time of 1 hour 29 minutes and 24 seconds. Kanto's next. The Game Corner music is playing and that means just one thing, we're about to spend all our money. But before we spend all our money, we have to get our Pokemon back and pick up a couple of bits from Professor Elm. We get the SS tickets as well as the Master Ball, and we can move on to Cherry Grove City where we withdraw our HM friends. We say hello again to Kenya, to Abra, to Psyduck and to Paris. And we move on to the Goldenrod Game Corner where we spend a grand total of 80,000 Poké Dollars for one move. Because we taught Hidden Power over Flamethrower in the last battle, we have to get that back. It's a one-hit wonder for Hidden Power in this run. Flamethrower is back on our move set, and we can move on into Mount Mortar, where we have the first of our two rare candies. First rare candy is just up the waterfall, which is why we can't pick it up earlier on, and we also go into the Whirl Islands. We pick this one up in the Whirl Islands now because we're near Olivine City to get the boat. We get the boat, we dig out, and we are in Vermilion City. First thing we do in Kanto is the last thing we do in Johto, and that is pick up another rare candy. This one's from the chairman of the Pokemon fan club and his Rapidash, and rapidly we can move on to Erika. Erika is a grass-type leader, so this should be a very, very simple battle. Tangela goes down in one hit, out comes the Victory Bell. Victory Bell also goes down in a single hit, and that leaves her with Blossom and Jumpluff. Velocim goes down in the same way as the first two, as does the Jumpluff. Four Flamethrowers is all we need to get the badge off Erika, and we can move on to Misty. Now, Misty could be a little bit trickier, so we're going to have to maybe set up a sunny day and start using Return. We use Crunch on the first two Pokémon to knock them out, though. That brings us on to the Lapras. Lapras is half ice, however, I did use a Crunch mistakenly there but it doesn't matter, we're on full HP as we go on to the Starmie. Starmie gets knocked out, and we didn't even have to Sunny Day because of Starmie's Psychic typing. Talking of Psychics, let's move on to Sabrina. Sabrina leads with an Espeon, and we Oko the Espeon. That feels satisfying after all those pesky sand attacks we've had from them. We outspeed the Alakazam, and a single crunch is all it takes to knock that one out. That leaves us with Mr. Mime. Not a fairy type yet, so it does go down to a super effective crunch. Moving on to Surge, he leads with a Raichu. Raichu goes down to a single flamethrower. He brings out his Electrode. Electrode is the only Pokemon, really, that can increase its evasion for us now. However, we outspeed and knock them both out with a pair of flamethrowers. Electabuzz is the penultimate Pokemon, but our 110 base special attack combined with a huge power of 95 from flamethrower means these battles are getting easier and easier. Brock could be an issue though, because he is rock type, however Crunch is very strong as well. It's 80 power as opposed to 95 power, but it makes light work of all of Brock's Pokemon. His first three go down, that leaves us with Onix and Kabutops left. Onix goes down in a single hit, and his final Kabutops also goes down to a single Crunch with a critical hit. Brock was a bit of a worry before I started playing this run. However, our huge special attack has really come up trumps for us in the most important parts of the game. So we can now cycle past the Viridian Hedge Maze and have a little chat with Blue on Cinnabar Island. In one of my test runs, I completely forgot to chat to Blue. I was wondering why I couldn't access the final gym. However, I don't make that mistake in this run. We pick up the rare candy and we can go onto the fire type leader, which is Blaine. It should be a fairly level playing field against Blaine. However, his Makago has very weak special defense and goes down to a single crunch. That brings us on to the Bumhead Fire Dug Magmar. That goes down in a single hit. Out comes Rapidash. Rapidash doesn't outspeed, and we take that out as well to beat Blaine, or we can move on to Janine. Janine, much like her father Koga, has a lot of bug types mixed in with the poison types. 
However, she leads with a Crobat and a pair of Weezing. The reason she leads with those is because they are the ones without the type disadvantage, and then she'll move on to the ones with the type disadvantage. So out comes Venomoth with a type disadvantage, and her final Pokemon is Ariados, which is also a type disadvantage, and we have beaten Janine. We can move on to Blue. Baloo leads with a Pidgeot, and that Pidgeot can sometimes be a little bit frustrating. We set up a Sunny Day, and it wing attacks us for a little bit of damage. However, the Sunny Day boosted Flamethrower is all we needed to knock that out. Rhydon comes out, and it's a massive pain in the bum, because it does not get knocked out with a single crunch, and Earthquake takes us down in one hit. So I decide to teach Solar Beam in place of Return. Having Sunny Day out means that Solar Beam will have its charging turn negated, and that'll mean we can outspeed the Rhydon and hopefully take it down in one hit. Wing Attack does a little bit of damage to us, but our Sun-boosted Flamethrower is enough to knock out the Pidgeot. Out comes the Rhydon, and Rhydon is four times weak to grass, so it goes down to a single Solar Beam. Solar Beam's going to be neutral on the Gyarados, so I decide to use it again and take it down into half health. It starts the rain, though, so we have to crunch it to finish it off. Out comes Arcanine, and it cannot use its Fire-type moves for very effective damage because it is raining and we resist them, so he uses an Extreme Speed, however a couple of crunches along with a Spadef Drop is enough to knock it out. Alakazam's next, and Alakazam is very weak to crunch, so we knock it out in a single hit. Final Pokémon is Executor, and the rain stops at the perfect time to knock out the Executor in a single hit, and we have our 16th and final badge of the game. We get the Earth badge off blue, and then we can have a little chat with Professor Oak. Professor Oak will open up Mount Silver for us, and that is our final destination of the entire challenge. It's all been building up to the red fights, but there's one last thing we need to do, and that is pick up the 10th and final rare candy. So as always with Red, what I'll do is I shall try at my current level with my current moves and see what inroads we can make. We flamethrower the Pikachu and we knock it out with a critical hit. That brings us on to Blastoise. Blastoise is a little bit pesky for us because it has Rain Dance and a boosted Surf will definitely take us down in one hit. We use our combination of Sunny Day and Solar Beam against the Blastoise, however we are still in Red as we take on the Espeon. Espeon is a Psychic-type Pokémon, so is weak to our Crunch. However, Crunch is not enough to knock it out, and we are back onto the Pikachu. We're at level 66 this time, so let's see if those extra levels make any difference whatsoever. We Crunch the Blastoise on the first turn, because it's just going to set up Rain Dance. We Sunny Day on the second turn, and then we can get to Solar Beaming. We still don't quite knock it out on our first try, though, and it takes an extra turn. And that leaves us on 131 HP for the Espeon. That goes down to 100 as we set up Sunny Day and Flamethrower it. And again, we don't quite knock it out in one hit. That takes us down to 68 for the Snorlax. We do quite good damage against the Snorlax, but a Body Slam is enough to knock us out. I use another three Rare Candies, and we're now at a very nice level 69. Pikachu uses Sander on us, and that takes us down into 166. A Sunny Day boosted Flamethrower knocks out the Pikachu, though. And this means we can get to work straight away with Solar Beam. We take Blastoise into the red, and then we can finish it off with a crunch as it uses Rain Dance. That means we're going to have to set up the sun once more against the Espeon. Espeon is probably the best Pokémon to use Sunny Day with, because it can't really hit us very hard at all. Swift does minimal damage, but it's not enough to take us out of the green, and that means we're on 133 for the Snorlax. Our first Flamethrower does big damage with a critical hit. He uses Amnesia, and we get a burn off on the second Flamethrower. But even with the burn, a critical hit knocks us out. We're going to level up again, this time to 73. We have used all our rare candies. It is now or never. This is a Hail Mary run, and we knock out the Pikachu in one hit. Out comes the Blastoise with the sun being strong. We take it into the red, and it uses Rain Dance. We can use a single crunch to take off the rest of its HP, and we're on to the Espeon. We set up the sun as he uses Reflect, but a single crunch is now enough to knock it out because we are a high enough level onto the Snorlax with 222 HP. He uses Amnesia and we are just going to have to keep flamethrowering it. We survive a Body Slam this time and we manage to knock it out in three. We are on to Charizard. Reflect fades and I decide to use Crunch against the Charizard. A critical hit almost knocks it out and we're on 54 as we move on to the Venusaur. One flamethrower is all we need to knock out the Venusaur in a single hit. And with a time of 1 hour 59 minutes and 30 seconds, we have beaten Red with the Houndoom. That puts it comfortably in 5th place on our leaderboard. So Dugong, Hypno, Executor, Pyloswine and Corsola all get knocked down a spot. 
and we have a look at page two now where poor poor Macargo is on its own and we're done. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please do like it. If you've got any comments, suggestions or feedback, please do let me know in the comments below or message me on Twitter at TrainerSquidgy. And if you've really enjoyed yourself, please do consider subscribing. But other than that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.